Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the 10th edition of the annual academic conference uh, 2021 hosted by the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Madras. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce the 3rd speaker in the keynote lecture series and the concluding speaker for day 1 of the conference. Professor Karthik Rao Kavale. Karthik Rao Kavale is an assistant professor in the division of social sciences at Ahmedabad University. He has a PhD in urban and regional studies from the Department of Urban Studies and Planning, a master's in city and regional planning from Rutgers, and a B.Tech from IIT Madras. He is currently working on a social history of regional roadworks, regimes of circulation, and rural development in southern India. He will be delivering his lecture on the topic Accounting for the Village, NG Ranga, and the Spatial Imaginaries of Indian Developmentalism. The other thing that I want to, you know, uh, before I start, um, just as a general background, this is a paper uh, in progress. Uh, so it's not a you know, full fledged paper that I'm presenting, but work in progress. And so, uh, in fact, uh, you know, most people say this um, uh, even for complete work. But in my case, this is quite literally true because, as you will see, the argument has been um, uh, worked out only part part of the way. Uh, and I'm going to, uh, you know, explain where what is remaining in the argument, right? What what part of the argument remains to be worked out? Um, so keeping that in mind, you know, clarifying clarifying questions or uh, any kind of uh, interjections would actually be quite welcome. Um, and the final thing is that I'm, I'm hopefully I'm not going to go uh, far beyond um, 30 minutes. We'll, we'll uh, like keep the part where I'm speaking fairly short and then we can just have a discussion for however long um, everybody is still uh, you know, able to uh, participate. Um, so let me begin. Uh, now my uh, paper is titled um, Accounting for the village. Um, and I'm, I'm using that, of course, in two senses. Um, you know, one, of course, is uh, accounting as a, as a, a form of knowledge production and how it was used at a particular point in history. Um, and the second sense I'm using it in is uh, how do you make sense of the village? Right? So I'm using it in those two senses. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm going to look at the work of somebody called NG Ranga. We will, of course, I will have a lot to say about it. But let me sort of motivate my paper a little. Now, this uh, uh, little paragraph in the uh, in my slide. Actually, let me go to slide share. Yeah. Um, so the this quote from Charles Metcalf, you would have probably come across at some point. Um, you know that village communities are little republics, and that they're kind of you know independent entities in India, um, and that you know dynasties may come and go, but the village community kind of remains as it is. It's not really affected by what's happening outside, and it doesn't really have too many connections with the outside world. Now, this was said by Charles Metcalf, who was a important colonial administrator in India in the 19th century. Um, and in fact, it's a it's a common feature in like colonial discourse on India. Um, it's common enough that Marx picked it up, James, uh, sorry, John Stuart Mill picked it up, and many other, you know, 19th century thinkers about India and even, you know, uh, people who are not um, necessarily focusing on India, like Marx, um, kind of uh, had this impression about Indian, uh, the Indian village community. Um, and the idea was that, so these village communities are supposed to be kind of independent, but, and this is an important, but as the modern exchange economy expands and goes further into the village, or, or you know, it transgresses into the domain of the village, the village community um, is likely to disintegrate, that it is not likely to survive the, uh, the this kind of uh, invasion of outside market forces, right? 
And so this you can, uh, you know, Marx in fact has this um, article in the New York Times on India. And he says precisely this, that the colonial regime is sort of dragging the Indian village community from its, um, you know, sedentary existence and into the modern uh, economy. Of course, it's a very violent process, but ultimately it's progressive because, you know, uh, you're becoming a part of the capitalist world's economy. Um, and so this is how the village community was thought about. The puzzle that, the, that I'm motivated by is that at some point in the 20th century, uh, we started thinking about the village community differently. Um, so if we now look at writings on the mid 20th century, that is just after independence, now uh, it's obvious in all of those writings that that we, there's still a lot of emphasis on the village community, right? Things like the uh, village development program, right? Um, that Nehru began. Um, the model villages kind of projects. The um, you know that that Albert Mayer was was responsible for. Uh, so these kinds of the community development project is what it was called. Um, they really did put the village community at the center of their um, project. Um, this was also true of uh, things like uh, Vinoba Bhave's uh, Bhutan and so on and so forth. Right. So the village community is the is the building block of Indian society that continues to be the way um, Indian development discourse was structured in the 1950s. However, and this is also recognized in the literature. Nobody seemed to think that uh, village communities are not going to be enmeshed in uh, market relations with the rest of the world. That was not uh, something that that uh, that was not how we were thinking about Indian village communities in the 1950s. We, as in, of course, not any of us in this room. Probably none of us were alive, but. Um, Generally, in terms of Indian development discourse, that was not how it was structured. Um, the idea that that the village community would have to exist within a within a broadly a commodity economy was kind of commonly uh, taken for granted. Now, this poses a problem because if the village community uh, faces an existential threat by market forces, then how can it exist within a co commodity economy? Right. If if agriculture is organized as commodity production, that is, if rice and wheat and pulses and cotton and all of these things are commodities that are that are to be bought and sold, right, rather than uh, exchanged uh, in as part of some customary arrangement, right, which is how it was imagined to be in the past, um, then then how do you uh, how do you Imagine the village community continuing to exist, right? And continuing to be the building block of Indian society. That is kind of the puzzle, right? Um, and uh, the same problem can also be extended to the category of the peasant, right? The Indian peasant or Kisan, as uh, in, in political discourse, it was uh, the Indian peasant was and continues to be referred to as Kisan or uh, farmer or, uh, you know, in uh, Tamil Nadu and in Karnataka, you would call it, uh, him or her a riot uh, and so on, right? So how do, you, how do you reconcile the fact that the Kisan is still such an important part, such an important figure in Indian development discourse and the fact that the Kisan is, of course, today it, it goes without uh, question that the Kisan is completely a part of market society. I mean, think of what's happening in Indian politics today. The entire focus of Kisan politics is what is the price that a Kisan will get for his or her produce in the market, right? So there is no question of the Kisan or the Indian farmer or the Indian peasant not being part of market society today. And that, in I will argue, uh, I mean, I think it's true. It's uh, generally accepted in the literature. That was kind of accepted in the 1950s as well. So if that is the case, then there's a, there's something that has shifted in our thinking about the peasant on one hand 
and on about our thinking about the village community as well. Right. So between Charles Metcalf and Marx to the 1950s discourse, something had shifted. Now, the, the, what I'm interested in in this paper is this process of resignification. What do I mean by resignification? There are signifiers, right? The peasant household, the village community, these are signifiers and they their meaning has changed, right? Now, how did that happen? Um, so that is kind of what this paper is, is really about. Now, I am um, referring to these conceptions of the village community and the peasant as spatial imaginaries. Um, this needs a little bit of elaboration. Um, so uh, what do I mean by spatial imaginaries? Uh, uh, there's a lot of growing work in geography uh, on uh, spatial imaginaries. These are discursive and performative representations of space and place. Um, and uh, I mean, why why uh, is it fair to call the the representations that I just narrated earlier as spatial imaginaries? Well, I mean, it really sort of helps. Uh, it it really shapes our thinking about how the village uh, is positioned vis-a-vis -vis all other places, right? and that is why I, I I would argue that these um, conceptions or representations of the village community uh, should be thought of as spatial imaginaries. And um, what I'm asking is how do spatial imaginaries change? And uh, what is the relationship between the underlying spatial practice and changes in spatial imaginaries? Now, um, I'm going to say, uh, you know, just give you a sense of my theoretical framework. Um, why uh, I've chosen a particular theoretical framework, and and you know, I'll just defend this theoretical framework. Okay. Now, um, we can think of this process in terms of uh, you know, like four units of analysis. Right? What what are we looking at? Uh, when we study change and spatial imaginaries, what are the objects that we are uh, analyzing? Um, so on one hand, there are signifiers, right? So these are uh, words that we use. These are symbols, right? Um, so when we use the word village community, when we use the word kisan, peasant, uh, these are, you know, signifiers. Now, they have different meanings attached to them. But the thing is, there's no one to one relationship. Right? And this is really at the heart of, you know, like uh, postmodernist discourse analysis. It, it really sort of focuses a lot on the slippage between, um, you know, the signifier and the signified. Right? So is the peasant a market actor or is the peasant uh, someone who produces for uh, self consumption? Um, now, in, in development discourse, you, you'll see both. Right? Um, and, and what I'm arguing is that you see a shift. So there's a there's a play, lay, uh, there's a play of difference, right? Uh, the, the signifier and the signified don't necessarily have a one to one relationship. Um, however, there and you know, in Foucault, there's also a lot of uh, focus on modes of knowledge production. There's these uh, if if the first two, the signifier and the signified, together form a, a discursive terrain, right? Um, now these discursive terrain uh, terrains in uh, Foucault especially are seen as produced in relation to modes of knowledge production. Right? Without modes of knowledge production, you can't have these discursive terrains. And so uh, Foucault talks a lot about you know how how do you uh, generate uh, how are truths produced in society? So how how is the truth that farmers are not earning enough? That farmer that that farm incomes are going down. How is it produced? There are modes of knowledge production there, right? So um, you know, um, in in recent work on spatial imaginaries, there's a lot of focus on these three. 
Now, my sort of push here is to say that something is missing and that really um, the, the, what is missing in the way spatial imaginaries are talked about um, is the uh, ultimate, the referent. Right? What do these signif signifiers refer to? The politics of reference for some reason in, in uh, post-structuralist uh, discourse analysis really gets, uh, gets short shrift. That is kind of my critique and, and that's where I'm sort of, that is my theoretical departure. Um, what does the signifier refer to? So what are these actual village communities? What's happening inside them, right? What is the state of the actual village community, right? So the change in spatial imaginaries is often explained uh, without understanding what is happening uh, in in um, what the, the changes in the actual material practice of let's say agriculture right now um, so to give you an example of that um, if you look at the work of Benjamin Zacharia who has um, written a book on um, sort of the the discourses of uh, you know the development discourses through which the nationalist movement was constituted in the early 20th century. Now um, he talks about this, right? The fact that socialists and communists and uh, um, you know like uh, conservatives and all these different kinds of um, uh, actors within the nationalist movement they constituted they they sort of uh, they they're operating on a common discursive terrain, right? And he uses the example of a village community and he talks about how different actors are using the idea of the village community differently. But the fact is that they're operating on a single discursive terrain because they're using these cons, uh, these signifiers, right? But they're putting them to different uses. Now this in itself is not um, uh, something that, that actors at the time didn't realize, right? So Gandhi in himself was in fact very bothered about this. And this is a phrase, um, you know, this is a, a piece of dialogue that I uh, caught because it was really relevant for my paper. You know, Gandhi is complaining to NG Ranga, who is a follower, and we're gonna talk more about Ranga in this paper. Um, he says, you know, you know, people use my phrases uh, to suit their own convenience. And he's talking about students using the word satyagraha for their politics. And he said, what they're doing is not satyagraha. Ranga was a professor and he's saying, your students, they're calling it satyagraha, but it's not satyagraha. But, you know, uh, I'm of course, I'm using this, this little sentence for my own purpose again. Um, you know, the, the fact that, um, you know, even categories like the village community were used for different purposes. But, what is lost out here is the fact that these these different actors were also deeply engaged with um, they were going and and visiting and studying actually existing village communities right and, and there was this engagement with the with the with the empirical that is missed out in this way of explaining changes in spatial imaginaries. i want to bring that into the conversation I do that by relying on a slightly different way of explaining, of doing discourse analysis, which is called critical, I mean, it's, it's called critical discourse analysis, it's called, also called critical semiosis. This generally relies, let me actually go back to uh, this slide here. Um, it, it relies on um, a more realistic, sorry, a realist epistemology of the social. And this comes from the work of Roy Bhaskar, um, who is a, um, you know, a, a philosopher. And he, he argues that, that um, you know, he's, he's criti critical on one hand of positivism, on the other hand of pure constructionism. And, and he says that, that uh, purely constructivist epistemologies um, conflate uh, what he calls the transitive and intransitive domains. Um, the transitive domain 
uh, is is that which is shaped by the scholar, right? So if if you're doing research on something, then you're you're producing discourse. Right? But the world out there um, is is not entirely shaped by the discourses that we as researchers produce. So the transitive and the intransitive domains, even in the social, even in the social world, are not entirely collapsible into each other. Right. So that is, in very simple words, uh, Roy Bhaskar's argument. Now, taking that forward and applying it to the realm of discourse analysis, um, people like Norman Fairclough, Bob Jessup, um, and Andrew Sayer have, have argued for, um, you know, a, a, what they argue is a more dialectic way of looking at all of these four things together, right? Uh, signifiers, concepts, modes of knowledge production, and ultimately the reference. And these are all shaping each other. It's not that there aren't slippages between them, right? Of course there are, but you cannot understand the, the process of discourse analysis without looking at all of them together, which they argue, and I think they correctly argue, uh, is not something that, that uh, post-structuralist, uh, what uh, is typically understood as post-structuralist discourse analysis is entirely uh, cognizant of. So how do we uh, do this? Um, how do we do critical discourse analysis? Well, you need to understand, uh, or we need to uh, explain uh, shifts in discourse in terms of three steps. Right? One is how do new variants of discourse get produced? The second is how do social actors, right, uh, select discourses that work for their for their particular projects, whatever political project that they are uh, engaged in, and how do they finally get retained and become dominant discourses within um, everyday material practice, right? So this um, these are the steps that they argue that that are needed to close the loop and to explain the process of uh, the construction of discourse. Um, the reason I said this paper is, is work in progress is that I'm right now primarily looking at the first step of this. What I'm going to explain today is the how a variant in the discourse on the village community got produced, right? And I'm going to say, I'm going to argue that, that um, that the work of economists in the early 20th century played an important role in generating a particular variant that I argue becomes dominant. Right? How it becomes dominant, I'm not going to show you because I've not worked it out yet. I like ideas from you all, but, but that's kind of um, what I'm trying to achieve in this project. So, I, I mean, this is the argument so far. Uh, it's not a complete argument. Um, um, the first, I mean, what I'm going to argue is that economists in the 1920s, the 1910s and 1920s, um, sort of found themselves getting drawn into political debates, right? But as a professional class, they needed ways to go about their work um, that are not entirely politicized, right? And so they develop new techniques of knowledge production um, that can cater to the political debates without getting entirely, um, you know, uh, subsumed into these debates, right? And what happens as a result is that the village community in economic, uh, in the work of these economists, comes to be treated as an ahistorical uh, object, right? That, that is something that can be treated, that can be studied without going too far into, like too much into the historical trajectory of evolution that it is positioned within, right? So you're not focusing on that historical trajectory, but looking at the village community as it exists right now. And I argue that by avoiding this historicism, um, they are able to um, reconcile the village community with generalized commodity production. Right? So this is how this variant 
in development discourse comes into being. That's kind of what I'm arguing so far. Okay. And let me sort of elaborate. I'm just going to spend uh, five minutes talking about um, two individuals, um, first Giranga and then another person, Gilbert Slater. So let me just give you a brief uh, biographical um, account of Ranga. Now, um, and I'm not, it's not going to be a linear narrative. Ranga um, is most famous for being one of the founders of the Swatantra Party in the late 1950s. Now, you may have heard of Swatantra Party. It was the party that Rajaji uh, C. Rajagopalachari founded uh, after leaving the Congress in 1959. And Ranga was the uh, general secretary of the party at the moment of its founding. Okay, so he's an important uh, person in the politics of post-colonial India. He also is the leader of the parli uh, parliamentary party of Swatantra in the third parliament, uh, that is 1962 to 67. And uh, in the late 1970s, he returns to the Congress. Okay, and I'm going to give you a sense of the context of this. Um, he returns to the Congress and then spends another couple of decades as a, uh, you know, a, a party leader of the Congress. And uh, he was also, um, you know, very uh, regularly elected to Parliament during all of this time. But I'm more focused on uh, Ranga's uh, prior political history, that is, uh, in, the, in the period before independence. Now, uh, Ranga starts off, um, he was born in a village called Nidiprolu, uh, uh, in a peasant family. Uh, he was of the uh, Nayaka caste, that is the Kamma of uh, Andhra. And uh, he was a big, uh, uh, his family was a big landed family. So they were pretty wealthy, um, had a lot of land in this village. And this is like, you know, uh, in the Krishna Delta in Guntur district. So obviously uh, very fertile land. And so, you know, uh, fairly wealthy, uh, relatively very wealthy. And so, uh, and he was also very brilliant as a student. And so, you know, generally the community, they were trying to be socially, they were socially mobile. They were trying to be assertive. They wanted some of their children to uh, become ICS officers. So yeah, Ranga at the age of 20 gets sent to, uh, Oxford. Uh, at Oxford, he goes and he comes under uh, sort of the influence of the nationalist movement there. And he decides actually he doesn't want to become an I ICS officer. Uh, instead, he chooses to do a research degree called the BCL um, under the um, guidance of somebody called Gilbert Slater, who I'm going to talk about in just a little while. He comes back, he finishes this, uh, sorry, he enrolls for this research degree, comes to India to do, you know, field work, to do his research, uh, and then produces a dissertation um, at Oxford under Slater's guidance, and then becomes a professor at Pachapas College in Madras, um, and later starts, uh, uh, then go, go, becomes a member of the Congress and becomes a member of the uh, uh, the new parliament, uh, not the, the legislative assembly, the central legislative assembly in 1930. And after that, you know, he becomes a very important peasant leader in coastal Andhra. Uh, he was one of the leaders of the uh, All India Kisan Congress before it gets taken over by the communists. And so the fact that, you know, he was constantly in the in conflict with the communists from the late 1930s onwards, and that's why he becomes very strongly anti-communist going forward. And that kind of explains why in the 1950s, he falls apart with Nehru. And, you know, that's why he then joins Rajaji in the Swatantra party, which is kind of seen as a right-wing party, or at least a pro-market, pro-capital kind of party. Um, so that, that's kind of his um, intellectual trajectory. What I'm focusing on is this period between in the 1920s and uh, early 1930s, where he's working as an economic researcher. And he did a lot of his work with somebody called Gilbert Slater, uh, 
Now, Gilbert Slater's uh, story is that he was a professor in Oxford, uh, no, not in Oxford, in one of the colleges in uh, that area. And then in 1915, he becomes professor, the first professor of economics at Madras University. Uh, he comes to uh, India as the first professor of economics, and he finds himself in an environment where a lot of students are parroting the ideas of Rana Day, of Naoroji, right? These are people who are saying that the British have impoverished India, right? They have created the uh, they are the British that British rule is the cause of Indian poverty, right? And he's kind of bothered by all of this, right? And he says that you know this is um, not a very scientific argument. These are not based on any kind of research. Um, it's you know entirely driven by ideology. Now, what we should be doing as economists is going to villages and studying what's happening. And so in 1917, he goes uh, to a village uh, called um, Eru Elipet, okay, um, in um, just south of Chennai. Uh, this is in South Arcot district. Um, it's the exact Tamil name is Eru Elipet, Eru Elipet. Okay. Um, now he goes and and starts. Uh, doing research there he spends a uh, you know this is not very uh, detailed research but, but remember this is the first such study of a village that was done like the first systematic study of a village in a non-administrative context right um at least in metras presidency now he you know comes up with a questionnaire he um you know collects the household budgets and farm budgets for a few households he uh, you know, produces a report and he then announces a competition where young students who have completed their BA uh, in whatever field will go and do this kind of research in their own villages. Okay? And so many people apply, they go and do the research, they write up the results, they send it to Gilbert Slater, and then he compiles the best of these studies into a book called uh, some South Indian villages. This is a classic. Okay, it comes out in 1918. Um, there are about 12 villages from different districts of Madras Presidency, um, and these have become classics because then people continue to study these villages, um, you know, in different time intervals, and uh, this tradition has continued till date. The entire village studies tradition uh, owes its origins to Gilbert Slater. So um, now, this is the person that Ranga uh, starts working with. Okay. Now, my argument about Slater and what he's doing here um, is that Slater's work uh, manufactures a very subtle shift because until now, um, Villages were, were being placed within this, this historical trajectory where they start off as these independent units and, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of coming under the sway of the market economy and therefore the village community, the cohesion of the village community is disintegrating. And this is seen most strongly in the work of Henry Main, uh, who produced this uh, book in uh, 1971 on Indian village communities. But similar arguments, right? Now, uh, somebody called Baden Powell um, sort of revised these arguments in the 1890s. Um, so sorry, Henry Main's work came in 1871. Baden Powell publishes his work in uh, 1890, early 1890s, right? And he's saying, well, but the original village community is not, no, village communities are not the same everywhere in India. They're different in the Northwest frontier province. They're different in Punjab. They're different in Madras and so on, right? And he's saying that they're also like evolving in different ways. Uh, the Rayatwari system is uh, uh, sort of um, dismantling the village community more rapidly than say the, the um, 
other so let's say the zamindari uh, or the um, you know the malguzari systems of uh, the united provinces and so on right so but there's still you know on one hand there's greater empiricism in the work of baden powell is relying on these uh, settlement uh, resettlement reports that the uh, administration the district administrations are producing but he's still sort of not able to completely get out of this historicist framework. Um, similarly, if you read the work of uh, Srinivasa Raghava Engar of uh, 1893, I think I got the name wrong, uh, but this is another very important work. Um, they're still kind of grappling with this idea. Okay, now by comparison, this historicism is completely absent in Slater. Um, right? Now, on one hand, he's taking the village as, the village community remains central to Slater's analysis because it is the unit of analysis, right? He's taking it as a given that the village community, the village is the unit of analysis and it is a given unit. He's taking the unit of analysis as given, right? It is empiricist in that way. It is ahistorical because he's not placing this village in any historical trajectory. Now, one important point to note is that this is not something that comes to Slater uh, as part of his training. This is not, it is not to say that all economists were like this, uh, right? Slater had previously done work on English villages, on enclosures, the enclosure movement in English villages. And this was a deeply historicist work. It was an account of the um, enclosure movement uh, for several centuries in English villages. This is before he came to India. So historic, it's not as if Slater was ahistorical to begin with. But coming to India, having to deal with uh, all of these students, right? He's teaching these students who are so caught up in this historic historicist framework and, and the his, this, uh, histor these historical arguments had become so deeply politicized, right? So my argument is that his way of getting out of this sort of creating a space of engagement that is not entirely subsumed by politics is to uh, avoid historicism. Okay, um, now wh what it does, however, is that the ability for cooperation uh, through collective action within the village community is no longer, um, you know, there is no direct relationship between that and um, the uh, extent to which it is uh, integrated within the market economy, right? Since the village community is assumed to exist, that is the unit of analysis, right? Now, in the village community, you may have some villages with more cooperation, some villages with less cooperation, right? So he says that in Nirvelpatte, there is uh, cooperation insofar as uh, all of the mango trees um, on the main highway, the produce is purchased collectively and then divided among the village. Okay, so he says that, look, the, uh, you know, the village cooperates. The, the, there is a lot of cooperation within the village in terms of its relationship with the state and so on. However, um, agriculture within the village is, you know, kind of uh, to a large extent integrated within the market. This is ta taken as a given and the two are no longer seen as contradictory. With each other. This is only possible because the village is no longer seen as uh, uh, the, the, the place within a historical trajectory, right? Now, that is as far as the method itself goes. Now, once you come up with this method, uh, it also allows you to ask different kinds of questions. One of the questions, the sort of questions that, um, now I'm just moving to Ranga here, but this is true of Slater as well. I'm just, I realized that I'm going slower than I imagined. Um, so I think I'll just take another 10 minutes and stop for questions, okay. Um, so, um, sorry, um, now in 
Let me actually explain this point using Ranga itself. Now, with this new mode of engaging with village communities, your uh, Slater and following him Ranga are able to engage with different kinds of questions. Um, around this time, there's this huge debate over whether, uh, you know, British rule has impoverished peasants or not, right? And uh, the standard argument, right, the, the back and forth between nationalists and uh, defenders of colonial rule, the colonial, the defenders of colonial rule will say, look, we are taking only this share of the total produce as uh, revenue, as land revenue. Now, uh, the assumption was that Mughal rule, which was assumed to be the, you know, the British colonial state inherited Mughal rule, uh, well, that is, it is the inheritor of Mughal rule. Now, they said that the Mughals used to take half the total produce as revenue, as land revenue, as tax. By contrast, and they will show using their um, resettlement reports and so on, that we are taking only this percentage and it is much less than half. And so we are a very progressive regime, right? Uh, this would be the discourse, of, this would be colonial discourse. This was how colonial discourse would operate. Um, that colonial rule is progressive because they are taking only this smaller share of the total produce, right? But what is interesting is that the only, uh, what was the only thing that was, and uh, by contrast, the nationalists will say, look, uh, this is such a large sum of money that is being extracted from Indian villages and being spent for all of these other, uh, you know, uh, things uh, that the British uh, regime is investing in. So either, you know, it would be a critique of railways, uh, which helped the, uh, you know, which helped the cotton uh, industry, the textile industry of Lancashire, or, you know, you're fighting wars in Iraq, or you're, you know, you're all of these other pursuits of the colonial, of the British empire. Right? And so you're extracting resources from Indian village communities and using it for all of these uh, pursuits. And that is why it is, that is how you're impoverishing India or you're impoverish, you're producing the impoverishment of India. But the entire focus was on how much is being produced and what share is being taken away as uh, land revenue, right? The, new way of engaging with the village community, this ahistorical empiricist mode of engagement allowed people like Slater to ask new kinds of questions. First, how much are farmers actually earning? Right? Now, to ask that question, it is not enough to know how much land revenue they are paying. You also need to know how much is being produced. That to some extent was also was being calculated earlier as well, because you know, you, you um, uh, needed to know um, price formation. And so uh, people would, so there was some kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, crop cutting experiment that used to be done in the resettlement uh, for the production of the resettlement reports. But for the product, for all of the earlier kinds of knowledge production, uh, and that the, the, Data source for all of these used to be these resettlement reports of the district administrations. They would almost never ask about costs of cultivation. But if you want to know how much the farmer is actually earning, whether the farmer is living a good life or not, the peasant is whether the peasant is learning living a good life or not, you need to know the costs of cultivation. You need to know the value of what is being produced. And you need to know what tax is being paid and so on and so forth. And what is left with the farmer, the peasant, right? Um, now, this new mode of studying the village community allowed for these questions to be asked for the first time, right? And in fact, when Slater began his research, there was no tradition of calculating the costs of cultivation. And in fact, in Slater's own study, this was not done. The first person to calculate costs of cultivation by attaching a monetary value to every input in the farm, in the production process in a farm, 
ஓ செஞ்சிடுறாங்க I I make this claim with slight trepidation because there might be others in other provinces but certainly for Madras presidency this is true and Ranga did this with great uh, I mean not with a lot of precision because his samples it's not like his sampling strategy was very uh, full proof or so on but uh, it was very comprehensive in the sense that he tried to estimate attach a monetary value to every little um you know input that goes into the production process in agriculture and uh, you know allied uh, activities like horticulture and so on, right so animal husbandry so this is a cattle budget but similarly you can see that he is also doing it for other uh, agricultural activities right uh, and in fact he did this for handloom weaving as well and he would be he was so attentive to detail that because you know like you all uh, anybody who has field done field work knows that if you go and ask uh, say a farmer you know how much how much do you pay for fertilizer what you are likely to get is a ballpark amount right and so uh, slater very admiringly writes in his uh, memo memoirs of uh, about ranga he says that you know ranga was so attentive to detail that he would go and ask like all of the people involved in the transaction what was the cost of that input right so if he is talking to a farmer then he uh, you know and he asks what is the cost of manure he would also go and ask somebody else from whom this particular farmer might have purchased manure he would also ask the wife he would also ask somebody else and only once everything gets tallied did he then note that down as the cost of that input right so now what you have is that what this does actually first one thing that happened is that income became um, the evidence of a peasant's well-being income measured in money terms this itself i argue is somewhat novel right and this can't really be said of let's say romesh chandra dats um, you know very pessimistic account of what's happening in village communities you know this is written in the first decade of the 20th century this is not really true of ramesh chandra dat but it is true of uh, slater and ranga that income becomes income measured in money terms becomes evidence of a population's well being in order to generate data on income you need data on costs of cultivation which means you are now treating peasants as fully integrated into the commodity economy even if they are not entirely actually integrated into the commodity economy right so at a at the level of the imaginary peasants have become part of the commodity economy then what happens to the village community right what ranga does um, not in his dissertation work which he did for slater but instead afterwards when he became sort of more involved in politics and the congress recruited him as a researcher for a survey of certain uh, districts that were coming under resettlement in 1931 he goes and he looks at the household and farm budgets for every household in a certain set of villages and he shows the extent of extraction right now this is very a uh, novel kind of evidence on the extent of surplus that is being extracted from the village and he shows that and he argues at least that village communities where they are more cohesive where they are able to prevent extractive relations with money lenders with um, uh, you know uh, uh, wholesalers and with uh, people from the towns right with the mercantile communities which are located in the town there the extent of uh, exploitation of surplus extraction from the village is less which means that the cohesion of the 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 uh, village community is no longer like uh, seen as autonomous because it is self sufficient but it becomes autonomous if it is if it is able to resist or prevent exploitation right so the metric for the persi- the persistence of a village community is not self sufficiency in ranga anymore but non exploitation this argument he is making even while you know claiming to be gandhian whereas for gandhi in hind swaraj 
a village community is autonomous if it is self-sufficient, right? And so now you see the emergence of a heterodox variant of the discourse on a village community. Okay, I'm going to stop here. All I've shown going back is the emergence of a new variant. I'm not shown how this gets selected by other people and how it becomes the dominant discourse and in the dominant strand of Indian development discourse. That is what I want to do. And that is what I'm going to rely on. For that, I'm going to rely on Ranka's career as a politician going into the 1930s and 1940s. I'll stop. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, we will now be opening the floor to questions. Uh, yes, Atriya, you can unmute and ask a question. Hello, sir. Am I audible? Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm Otrio uh, from the Institute of Development Studies, Kolkata. So I would just like to congratulate you for your excellently novel approach to locating political economy in the colonial period of India. But I would, would just like to ask you out something because uh, like my focus is on the agriculture ag agrarian question in the contemporary times. And uh, like I would like I, I am trying to approach it from a structuralist perspective. So mm -hmm. kind of we have moved a lot from the uh, 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 Dr. Bradley thesis and today we see that like a major trend in the leftist argument was that how to like reconcile the mode of production debate and transition debate and land relations become a key variant in the understanding of uh, the village community in that sense. So, so we see yeah. that like, so we see uh, like movements like Tehaga Telangana, Naksalwari and today like th things are happening. But uh, mm -hmm. as a as a in, individual researcher who is also a leftist, I would just like to ask you that uh, agrarian question is a deeply politicized issue. Yeah. But when when as a researcher you try to engage with the agrarian question, you see on the one side that NSSO data reveals that migration is changing the village, village community into heterodox units. And then you see that land fragmentation is happening not because of structure and issues, but because of demographic issues. And I'm talking about the 75 uh, fifth round of the NSSO sample survey, sir. And yeah. on the other hand, and on the other hand, you see political analysts talk about how landlords exploiting a semi-capitalist, semi-feudal economy or bourgeois leadership. So how do you reconcile these two angles as a researcher, sir? Because it's a very problematic situation in order to kind of find the middle ground as a researcher, sir. And secondly, since you were talking about space in this entire, mm -hmm. like the composition of speciality, Henry Lefebvre talks about how like cities, I mean, capitalism extends cities to the countryside so that there is no clear demarcation between the city and the country. Now, yeah. today we see a new phenomenon happening, which also um, uh, Michael Levian talks about in his work, uh, that, that, there, that, that there is a uh, tendency of the Indian state to appropriate land in favor of the, in favor of the uh, private real estate market. Now, mm -hmm. in such a situation, we see that urban villages are existing simultaneously with new right, new, new kind of cities, new exclusive spaces. Now, how to yeah. mix, how to make sense of the land relations, the cultivation and the entire life levy the life of this kind of an inter intermixture that a heterodoxy which, which Foucault would term as a heterotopia as a trope if I would just like to point out these are two of my questions that I would just like to ask you as a researcher sir. thank you um, uh, to the organizer should we take many questions or should we go one after another Okay, let me just answer and then we'll take the next set of questions. Um, so, you know, both questions that you asked are very big questions and, uh, you know, uh, so my dissertation engages uh, 
of which this paper is only a small part. Um, and, you know, as you can see, this is the part where I've not really completely worked out the argument. Um, but yeah, the, both of those questions I do engage with. So, um, but it's, you know, it, it's like very hard to uh, come up with anything uh, with a final word on any of these things. So they've been argued in so many ways for so long that the, the, the field of arguments is, is incredibly dense, right? So I'll, I'll just try to, um, you know, within the space that I have to answer a question of this kind, um, on the mode of production, uh, I just tell you like one one way of engaging with it that I like, okay, uh, and that's not a complete answer, but I, uh, it's just a pointer for you if you've not looked at it already. But you may have because you probably, um, you know, if given that you're 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 uh, in in Bengal, uh, right? So the work of Kalyan Sanyal I really like. Um, his argument is that you can think of uh, these, uh, you know, the kinds of formations that we see in India today, uh, but also going back in the past, as the outcome of primitive accumulation and its reversal. Um, I really like that because it, it explains how, on one hand, there is accumulation going on, right? Like the kind of things that Levian is talking about. On the other hand, you also see like so many small farmers, right? How can you co reconcile the two? It's like it's the the modal um, farm size in India is not increasing. In fact, it is decreasing very rapidly and alarmingly for, for a lot of agricultural economists. But if it becomes even more fragmented, uh, if uh, yields might start falling, that kind of thing, um, right? So uh, to explain this kind of thing, you might want to use Kalyan Sanya, the only point that I will make is that in addition to primitive accumulation and its reversal, and this is kind of the argument I tried to make in my dissertation, but it's not published. Um, can we also think of formal subsumption and its reversal? And then as a next step, you know, this is Marx, uh, um, relative subsumption and then its reversal. Uh, what will because you know, in in Marx, you have primitive accumulation, then you have formal subsumption, and then you have relative. Uh, sorry, um, right? Um, real subsumption. Uh, sorry, I'm just a little um, dazed right now. So, uh, can we then think of formal subsumption and its reversal, and then real subsumption and its reversal? Um, and what would that look like? It, it's it's still uh, you know uh, this is something that I've been thinking about for some time. On the second question on Lefebvre, I don't find this idea of planetary urbanization or uh, you know urban society very convincing, uh, precisely for the reason that I don't think one mode of production uh, actually does universalize. Right? Uh, Lefebvre's idea of urban society is basically that uh, the mode of production of space um becomes the uh, you know uh, the capitalist mode of production of space subsumes every other form of space making within it um for the same reason for the same reason that i just pointed out i don't think that that can be held to be true even in what we conventionally understand as cities that i don't think that is true i don't think there's a single mode of production of space which, which would actually leave Lefebvre's argument uh, in a very weak place. Uh, I mean, I can go say more about that, but you know, I just stop there on, on these sets of questions. Thank you so much, sir. I would like to I would like to talk to you about this later on if you want. Yeah, so um, you can take my email ID at the end of the session. Thank you, sir. Hi, Dr. Karthik, am I audible? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, hi, I'm a, I'm a fourth year student in the MA program in the department and a big fan of your Patrick Geddes paper. And so I will, okay. I will try to. Yes, yes. 
and also the fact that you you're also an alum of the of of IIT Madras, a lot of people know not do not know about that. That is true. Uh, that is true. Yeah. So um, I'm going to root maybe the question because I'm theoretically interested in in the difference of the political approaches that get us and uh, uh, even Indian nationalists uh, were trying to, you know, were, were, were advocating and the sort of disjuncture over there, which ultimately did not lead to the success of Geddes, uh, or Geddesian conception of planning. And so I was wondering um, whether in the post-colonial era, in this developmentalism that we're talking about right after independence, what sorts of notions of historical, uh, because we're also talking about historicism, what sorts of notions of historical time do you see emerging in uh, in this post-colonial uh, developmentalism, developmentalism narrative? It's an excellent question. Uh, so just for uh, the audience and people who don't know about the Geddes paper, so Patrick Geddes is a town planner um, about whom I've done some research and published one paper. Um, and in that paper, so Geddes was this, um, you know, uh, he argued uh, he, he's very famous for arguing against like whole scale, like very ra radical transformation of urban spaces. And, you know, he believed in cities as organisms. And he said that, you know, you should do, um, you should, you should make only small interventions because, you know, just like in an organism, if, if, you know, there's one part of the body that's not functioning well, you'll try to intervene as little as possible just to solve that one little problem. But on the whole, you see the, a uh, human body as a self self regulating system right so similarly uh, Getty saw cities as self regulating systems and uh, he uh, argued that you should you should do only what he called conservative surgery and uh, in my paper i argue that uh, you know there, there's a certain conceptualization of historical time in that way of thinking about the city and it's a continuous he, he's operating in continuous time whereas ways of thinking about time, historical time, are different in different contexts and different for different politics, right? And I argue that nationalist politics necessarily had a, necessarily had a discontinuous uh, uh, way of thinking about time. Therefore, the, you know, Geddes was not really, uh, Geddes' ideas didn't really work for Indian nationalism. That is sort of the uh, paper. Um, now, uh, Jayant's question is, you know, what do we, wh how do we understand you know, conceptualizations of time going forward? Now, um, I have showed in this paper is, so by the way, Gilbert Slater and Geddes were uh, collaborators. They write a paper, uh, write a book together, a, sh a short book on um, how to understand the First World War, right? This is, they're, they're both in India at this time and they're collaborating to, understand the first world war um i forget the title of the book um but this you know in slater also you see this he's um he's kind of setting aside these um you know because he sees that that um historicism and and you know ways of thinking about um the village community in time are, aren't really conducive for like a active engagement with people who are not of the same political. Of course, Slater is kind of supportive of the colonial state and he is working with students. These are students in Madras University. They're almost entirely supportive of the colonial, anti-colonial movement. And so, you know, a historicism becomes his way to engage with this audience. Um, now, the thing is that it works only to an extent. And so in Ranga, you see now like going, uh, you know, in subsequent decades, you see the return of historicism in a sense. And, and ultimately, um, you know, the, because the nationalist movement had a conception of um, a discontinuous change and, and Ranga, was also, you know, and then Ranga also gets caught up in this, um, you know, coming up with peasant histories. And he says, well, you know, I'm going to write a history of the peasant kingdom of, um, you know, he calls uh, this thing the uh, Vijayanagara as a peasant kingdom because it was ruled by the Nayakas. 
and he said, I'm going to write a present history of the Vijayanagara and so on. And so he also gets caught up in this myth making and so on. Um, but my my thing is that you, you're always going to see a flip flop. Right? And so in politics in India, in Indian politics today, of course, you know, the, the right wing, the BJP has its um, you know, ways of thinking about both the past and, you know, they're, they're, they've also got futuristic projects, uh, things like the smart city and, and so on. So in a country like India, you're always going to have this deep desire for discontinuous change. Because you'll say, finally, our time has come. Now we have to make rapid, rapid uh, advances. And, um, but then, of course, they, then, you know, sometimes people will get realistic. They'll say, look, you know, Bombay is not going to become Shanghai. Um, let's make small, small changes. Let's be, you know, let's be realistic. But that the, uh, the desire for becoming Shanghai is, is not going to go away. Or, you know, London or uh, New York or whatever your, your uh, desired goal is. Um, and so, uh, you know, constantly, I think politics will have to constantly, you know, on one hand be rooted in reality, which is kind of what we can take from Geddes, but also engage with that desire for rapid change and also desire, desire for going back to some pure past, uncorrupted past where, you know, um, we were not exploited and we were not um, uh, enslaved by some foreign uh, ruler. And, you know, again, whether the, that uncorrupted, uh, uh, pure past can be uh, a pre-Islamic past as uh, the BJP would like it. It can be a Buddhist past for, for Ambedkar. It can be, uh, you know, the, the uh, like an Islamic golden age for uh, Muslim uh, politicians and so on, right? The, but there was oh, there's always going to be this this desire for a past which you can't escape. Um, and similarly, a desire for this glorious future also, like a rapid uh, move to that future also is going to be there. We have to, as uh, researchers and as uh, in the public sphere, we have to engage with that desire. Trying to, you know, just push it aside will work for a while, but not, not forever. I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer, but that's kind of how. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I, I have one more point to offer, but I mean, I, I no, you can I... an opportunity to other people if they want to ask questions. Can I ask a question here? Yeah, sure. Hello, I'm Abha and I uh, uh, really enjoyed your lecture. I'm an urban designer and I'm from School of Planning and Architecture. So, um, it's part of Delhi. Delhi. Oh, okay. Nice. And uh, it was really a uh, uh, very enlightening uh, lecture because uh, rural economy and, you know, rural community, I'm not really very conversant with. But uh, to understand that there is so much of dynamics and so much of, you know, uh, work uh, that has been done and is being done right now on how things are changing and how, you know, uh, different aspects of it are being studied by researchers. It's, it was really uh, a great uh, session for me. Um, there are two things that I found, you know, very similar to how uh, we look at urban societies. The first one was when you talked about the, uh, to understand your topic, when you talked about the signifier, the signified modes of knowledge and ref, uh, referral. I feel that, you know, with the same perspective, you can see lots of urban communities working because, you know, you always have these four things where there is uh, an, a, a set of people who are engaging with another set of people. So they are signifier and signified and what they are, you know, exchanging is the mode of knowledge and, you know, how one looks at that mode of knowledge probably becomes the referral. So that kind of a framework can actually be used for 
uh, urban communities also. It's not like uh, is is it? Uh, do you think yeah, that no, it is? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a general description of how semiosis happens. That is how discourses get produced in in any context, yeah. Yeah. urban, in, rural, in any... India, yeah. Yeah. US, everywhere. I mean, this yeah. is uh, it's drawn from the. I mean, I I'm drawing these ideas from the critical realist framework. So, yeah, go ahead. And similarly, similarly, when you talk about variation, selection, and retention. We see a similar thing when we discuss typologies, you know, where we uh, try to understand uh, what what is the root of a particular form and uh, how did it vary uh, for the first time and then how uh, did it get select, you know, uh, by uh, a whole community of people and then how, how it evolved to be a typology. So do you think it is similar to that phenomena in uh, the urban context? They, you know, we kind of look at typology yeah. of urban form. Yeah, yeah, except that, yeah, I mean, uh, you, but urban form, so urban form is not the same as discourse. No? So uh, what I'm talking about, the variation, see, the variation, selection, retention, it can also, it's uh, th these ideas are coming actually from evolution. Okay, um, so the, uh, these realist uh, philosophers, they're getting this from, like if you think about how species evolves, right, in natural selection. So there is a genetic mutation. Um, now, uh, there are different genetic mutations and then certain um, mutations perform better in the environment than others. Uh, and this, you know, my ecologist friend was explaining natural selection to me just the other day. So, um, and so some things get selected because they're better in that particular environment, they work better, right? So a giraffe with a long neck is able to get more food than a giraffe with a short neck. Therefore, the long neck giraffe survives and, and reproduces faster and so on. And that is how that, that trait, the long neck of the giraffe, giraffe gets retained in the population. Right now, uh, you can can you use this to explain uh, typologies of urban form? You the mechanisms are different, right? So the mechanisms for discourse, for instance, right? Like why do certain people uh, select a particular uh, discourse uh, and you know you choose to use it? Uh, then why do others? Why, why does something get become more dominant and why do certain things fail to survive? That is a, uh, I mean, it, that requires a political explanation. Now, how do you explain the choice of urban form? Uh, why are different actors, agents choosing particular urban forms over another, right? Uh, there the mechanisms have to be worked out. You have to work out the mechanisms. The mechanisms will not be the same for biological selection, they'll not be the same for discourse selection, they'll not be the same for selection of urban form. Um, that That is context specific, right? So I, I was just making a general point there. Uh, but, but yeah, that, at that level of generality, what uh, it can be used in your context as well, but the mechanisms have to be worked out. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks. Jayat, I mean, you said you had another point but, uh, since nobody else has anything to say. Very quickly. Uh, I, Very... Uh, I have also okay. added a question in the chat box. Uh, uh, so we'll, we'll hear from Jayat first. Okay, thanks, thanks. Uh, very quickly, I just, uh, this is not a question, but uh, more of a small discussion sort of point that I wanted to offer. In mm -hmm. the sense that I find, uh, uh, I have not read Ranga, but now I will, I will be sure to. And by the way, the book that you mentioned uh, between uh, that Geddes and, and Gilbert wrote was Ideas of War, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think Ideas it's a series. War. Yeah. And uh, one of the three books in that uh, series is uh, between is co-authored by Slater and uh, Geddes. The other two are Geddes and Thompson or some, some other co-authors. 
but Got but it. it was uh, done by Galician. But what was your point? Right. So I mean, uh, in Renga, I see a sort of not war, but a but a very interesting, uh, as you said, a heterodox compilation of ideas from various places, especially mm -hmm. because um, he is a Gandhian, but he is also. Mm -hmm. Uh, if you would put him in a label, he is also a classical liberal in a very high again pro market position. Um, yeah, uh, in the same kind of politics as represented by Minu Masani and as you said, Rajaji, Patandra Party. And then, uh, I'll, but I'll have more to say about that, but yeah, right. Uh, but also, he's not, uh, I mean, he's retaining the villageness of a village in his, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in his politics. He's not moving on to cities and he's not advocating that, especially because yeah. he's. Uh, preventing, I mean, he's he's reconceptualizing them as sort of places that can prevent surplus extraction. And in that sense, I see a very important prescience because I see this happening in in, in engaging with the research at the department, say Professor Swali Benjamin over here, and uh, Professor Sai Balakrishnan who's at Berkeley. Both of them have kind mm -hmm. of looked at uh, special economic zones in India, in Sri Perambudur, or in the industrial corridors in Pune. And they found various ways in which either locals by creating, by occupying spaces to, uh, by the creation of small shrines dedicated to native deities, mm -hmm. or in Pune, uh, the, the sort of mutation of the, the pre-existing agrarian caste-based sugar cooperatives into an electoral politics mm -hmm. uh, kind of thing. I see a sort of a similar sense of uh, the old pattern of the village or the agents in the village uh, kind of appropriating space and kind of exerting uh, their claims to land to prevent surplus extraction. That was it. So, uh, I'll, I'll respond to the second point and then go to the first. Uh, so, um, that's I think very interesting. It's a very interesting extension of what I described. The only difference is that what, uh, for instance, Sai is talking about uh, isn't exa exactly surplus extraction. The surplus extraction is where you are extracting surplus produced in the during the production process. Right. So, if for instance I generated 10 kgs of I produced 10 kgs of wheat, right? Um, now um, two kgs get extracted by the money lender, right? Uh, over and above what is genuinely due to him because he extended the capital that I needed to produce the wheat, right? Um, so there's surplus extraction there, right? That is surplus extraction. What Sai is talking about is taking the means of production itself, right? You've taken the land itself. So now that also is reversed, right? So that also can be resisted in the village community, but it can play a role in resisting that also. That would be called, let's say, I mean, if you wanted to come up with a simple phrase, we will say, you know, the village community resists the uh, process of primitive accumulation. Or you can, if you want to use Harvey, you can say accumulation by dispossession or whatever, uh, gentrification, not gentrification, but maybe, um, you know, uh, other, you know, there are so many of these concepts these days to describe the same. So, but the, the, that is the difference, right? What I'm talking about is surplus produced during the production process. Um, but the two are related, right? One leads to the other in many ways. Um, as for the second, the earlier point, uh, is Ranga a classical liberal? Um, I would actually say no. I don't think he ever became a classical liberal. What he became was militantly anti-communist. And uh, therefore, kind of phobic of any talk of socialism. And the fear, there was a genuine fear that, that uh, so called, uh, uh, you know, democratic socialism of the Nehruvian kind was creeping towards Soviet type communism. That fear was quite genuine in the 1950s, which is why he becomes very like. Uh, and since he and why is he militantly anti-communist? Because of his experience in coastal Andhra, where he formed the All India Kisan Congress, he was the leader of the Kisans, and then the communists took over. They they basically captured the All India Kisan Congress that was formed by uh, Ranga in uh, collaboration with um, this um, name I'm forgetting. 
um, Indulal Yagnik in Gujarat, and in Bihar, I think Swami Shraddhanand or Swami Swami Sahajanand, right? So Sahajanand in Bihar, uh, Yagnik in Gujarat, and Ranga in Andhra are the big leaders of the Kisan movement in the early mid 1930s, and then the communists just capture it. Uh, Initially, Shraddha, the Sajanand is willing to work with them, but the other two remain staunchly anti-communist. And because they are, you know, like um, thrown out of the Congress, of the Kisan Congress, um, Ranga becomes very, uh, you know, militantly anti-communist. And therefore, in the 1950s, when he sees Nehru, now until Gandhi was there, um, you know, Ranga remained in the Congress, in the, in the, all India, the National Congress, Indian National Congress. Um, but after Gandhi's death he's, and uh, Patel's death, um, he sees this, uh, you know, the slow um, creep towards what he thinks is communism. And the, the last straw is when Nehru tries to, uh, in the Nagpur Resolution of 1959, Nehru tries to push for village cooperatives. And uh, Ranga says no. And Ranga, by the way, is not the only one. Charan Singh also says, Charan Singh uh, ensured that the, that motion gets, uh, that resolution gets defeated. Uh, more than Ranga, it was Charan Singh who had political, like the, the muscle to, to resist the Nagpur resolution. Um, but Ranga leaves the Congress at that stage and with these classical liberals and with the, uh, with uh, Rajaji, who's, who was more interested in political, you know, not letting Nehru become the, the single center around which all of Indian politics revolves. So these, these people together come and set up the uh, Swatantra party. But they, they always remain kind of disparate factions within the party. Ranga is more interested in, in peasant politics. And he, his argument is that village cooperatives will destroy the autonomy of a peasant, right? Um, that though the Gandhians, so Vinoba Bhave uh, falls in line and says that village cooperatives are what Gandhi called Gram Swaraj. And Ranga says, no, 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 that is not Gram Swaraj. Gram Swaraj means the village community remains uh, cohesive, but uh, the, the peasant's autonomy also is a is how the village community, and this is traditionally true of Andhra villages, that the peasant was never like part of one cooperative uh, which collectively cultivates the land, right? That has never probably been the case in coastal Andhra, right? So for Ranga, that is not the village community. And so he says, uh, you know, but then he returns to the Congress Precisely because he's, he feels on one hand, I mean, it's also a political necessity because by then Congress has become very strong in 1970. But also Indra, under Indra Gandhi, there was no attempt to, um, to collectivize land. That's why he was very comfortable with returning to the Congress in 1972. I hope that kind of explain. So I don't think he was that inconsistent in, you know, going to Satantra then coming back to Congress. So, I understand better now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe... So I have a uh, query. Uh, do you yeah. do you see uh, any extension of NG Ranga's ideas in in the current uh, bureaucracy? Say at least in South Indian, um, you know, governments. Say in Andhra or in Tamil Nadu. Like, say, with respect to specifically related to land administration departments or, say, the rural de uh, development departments, at One least the state development teams. I mean, the, the work that I presented, the Ranga's work that I was talking about, I think this is where these, you know, there's a, a very important committee of the central government called CACP, Committee of uh, Agri Agricultural Costs and Prices, which you know, the reports of these, the CACP reports, farmers unions in India look at very closely because they, it, it is bread and butter for them. 
Now the methodologies of these, the methodology of the CACP is, uh, you know, if you look at the intellectual origins of that, that kind of work, it, uh, you can locate it in people like Ranga, what they were doing in the 1920s. Uh, what the administrate, like the land administration does, they don't, uh, so they collect uh, information on uh, output and uh, acreage. So they, the kind of data that they collect is actually more similar to the data that you will see in resettlement reports, uh, which is why India's agricultural statistics are actually pretty bad. Uh, we've not changed the way, like what these, uh, especially the revenue departments in India have been doing the same thing for like 100 years. Now. Uh, it's a scandal. The fact that they've not changed anything at all. So a lot of these new techniques are not, they are probably more likely to be employed by say NSS or, you know what, of course NSS does today, which Ranga didn't do is proper sampling. But in terms of the kinds of questionnaires that they ask and so on, um, that's where you, you will find it. NSS and CACP and, you know, all of these economic research um, committees that the government of India has, or even some state governments probably don't have. Yeah, yeah. and uh, if nobody else has a question, I think Adri Otrio has another question, uh, which, you know, he's written down, but I'm happy to hear from you. So I was asking you that, uh, since you told about the book written by Ranga, uh, where he represented Vijayanagar as the peasant kingdom, and the term peasant comes in circulation uh, in his rhetoric a number of times. Do you agree mm -hmm. with your, do you agree with his characterization of uh, all Indians engaged in primary production as peasants? See, uh, because many these terminologies uh, uh, of uh, like peasant, uh, then farmer, sharecropper, jodha, agricultural laborer, etc., very defined connotations in formal economic truths. So, uh, as an econom economist, how do you look at this characterization of everybody in and clubbing together them as peasants, which comes down comes down to to the event? Um, no, I don't think Ranga is uh, calling everybody a peasant. What he is saying is, if you are uh, cultivating your own land, then you are a peasant. But what is See, also you should understand the context, right? So there are no, this is in, a, in Rayatwari villages, there are no Jyotedars at all. Um, that is a, more like a Zamindari context. In, in a Rayatwari context, what you will have are big landlords and they may not actually do any cultivation, but they're doing more managerial work. Now there, there's a bit of a, you know, you can say Ranga, but you know, that is very well known that Ranga was, uh, you know, throughout he was very consistent that his main constituency is the uh, big Kamma landowners. And he, he was very careful to defend their interests. And so this, you know, the fudging the distinction between a big landlord and a small, small farmer, big farmer, small farmer, um, landless laborer, um, that is, Obviously, you know, any big landlord will do that. They, they'll define farmers, farmer politics in such a way that it incorporates everybody. However, in Ranga's defense, he did, uh, like, you know, in his book and all, you'll see several, like a fair, some effort to uh, treat the landless laborer uh, as a class, landless laborers as, as a class in their own right. And to talk about what is a fair, um, you know, a fair arrangement between uh, the peasant class and the landless labor class. So that much, um, you know, you will see in Ranga, but it is not obviously not like the kind of sophisticated analysis that more sophisticated analysis that some of the communists were doing at the same time. Right? Just to give you an example, of course, I mean, that that kind of, um, you know, erasure of class distinction is there in Rana, a little bit. Yeah. But that, 
I mean, it's not surprising because that's his class position. Thank you, sir. Um, all right. Uh, with that, we bring to close day one of the 10th edition of the annual academic conference 2021 hosted by the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Madras. We are extremely grateful to Professor Karthik Rao Kavale for his esteemed presence this evening and for that insightful lecture. We hope to host you again in the future editions of our conference.